Welcome, welcome to our last webinar this year. Uh, my name is Carolina Neideck and I work for Data Art from our lovely Munich office. Together with my colleagues Victor and Dimitri, I'm going to discuss a very interesting topic, the impact of generative AI on insurance industry. So over to you, Victor. How are you? How is the weather there? Not bad. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Victor. I'm a business analyst in financial practice uh, data art, specializing in insurance and insurtech projects. Uh, within my daily duties, I'm really focused on getting understanding of uh, real business needs, opportunities, and aligning that what technology is able to offer to bring some real value to our customers. So here today with all of you, I'm really curious to have that discussion and kind of explore what me too, interesting me too. might there be with generative AI for insurance? Thank you, Carol. Dmitry, pass it to you. Thank you, Victor. Hi, everyone. So my name is Dmitry. I am leading our AI lab from the technology side, and we are doing a lot of things in generative AI for the last year. We are building prototypes, speaking with the clients. So we have pretty recent dump of the industry and uh, how insurance reacts, how financial services react. So I'm happy to share this knowledge with you and speak about generative AI and how to build these solutions today. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Um, the most important thing, uh, everyone is probably wondering, uh, listening to us, what we are going to talk about. So definitely we want to discover how generative AI tools are already reshaping the industry and providing uh, solutions. We want as well gain a deeper understanding together with Victor and Dimitri of the typical workflow for implementing generative AI. And of course, uh, explore a range of compelling uh, use cases for this technology. So it's super interesting. It was very interesting 2023 and um, the year is not over and I'm pretty sure it's going to be super exciting uh, topic for 2024. But guys, uh, what do you think about uh, um, impact of generative AI on, on industries in 2023? From my point of view, it's uh, really growing now. And during the last year, mm -hmm. we've seen it shifting. It is, yes, yes. yes. From my point of view, uh, shifting from, let's say, a newly emerging concept, really interesting, challenging, and sparking lots of conversations, questions of mm -hmm. uh, how could it be used, what is feasible, would it totally change and disrupt the, our customer ways of work. And, and I'd say that the way I see it, during the last year, we've seen it kind of shifting to the next phase of early adoption. Absolutely, uh, yes. And more and more companies around us kind of starting their journey in doing some proof of concept pilot projects. Uh, first, trying to get some real understanding of uh, what value could be achieved uh, practically, let's say how it could be done. And at the same time, get some uh, hands-on knowledge on what it takes to bring it into a part of daily operations. And I mean such aspects as policies, accountability aspects, and similar issues. What does it look for you? Uh, I, I can I can tell from the technology side. So uh, mm -hmm. what we saw in early this year that clients starting to understand the impacts and they starting to generate the use cases, still being very cautious about the privacy and security. And all through the year, we saw how the policies changed, how all of the cloud providers evolved their uh, compliance departments, uh, privacy policies, how open yes. source models uh, mm -hmm. were deployed. So then we kind of shifted from my standpoint to like privacy issue from privacy issues and we now understand really well how this information is handled that uh, usually call services do not train uh, the model on your data because if you integrate to end-to-end uh, -end business solutions and the prior solutions they don't need it they don't want to lose the clients about the products like chat gpt public versions of it like part they can be trained on your data so it's not enterprise service it's very important to know and understand and not to be confused and now it's more the conversations like we tried this and that so we tried different of POCs and now how we can move to production so that's uh -huh. what uh -huh. we 
we are seeing right now. So the trend yes. one year evolved from the idea and we now see the, the production integrations uh, mm -hmm. so from technology side. Yeah, so Carolina, what do you think? Well, what's very exciting for me, and I, I am really thinking about that every time I'm speaking to insurances, um, they have collected over the years an amazing wealth of data, right? And, and what they are going to do with that? Because we all know, and I, I believe uh, you, Victor, from the business point of view, and you, Dimitri, from the technical point of view, mm. um, if you have the right data, a lot of right data, you can do pretty amazing things in a company and you can really yeah. support the insurance industry, don't you think? And that's why I am really very excited for, for the presentation you have for us today. And please, our lovely audience, do not forget to ask questions because um, this is such an exciting topic and we are going to continue to speak about it uh, for sure next year. Yeah. Thank you, Carl, for <clears throat> bringing the aspect of data. I think it's really crucial here. And uh, I have an impression here that here might be some kind of opportunity of what actually generative AI could uh, bring uh, for the help of such, let's say, pretty conservative industries as financial and Absolutely, insurance yes. ones. So, and also, I'll share what it looks like from my point of view. And Mitri, please uh, feel free to add more color to that since you're closer to technology, have much better expertise in it. So the way I see it within previous waves of artificial intelligence, it was more strong, it has more strength with a array of technical data produced, mm -hmm. let's say machine produced data, and it uh, had very much to promise strong impact on such industries as manufacturing, for example. And now with generative AI, due to its a bit different nature of the approach, it kind of gives a promise of removing the barriers between the knowledge workers, the people who need to digest, process lots of information already available in the documents, human readable text and other sources, not machine readable data, mm -hmm. in the traditional mm -hmm. understanding of that but it kind of gives the uh, opportunity to bring uh, all the data closer to these people which are at the core of such industries. Does it sound right to you? Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, like historically uh, AI lacked the data in the beginning. So that's why they have a couple of winters so-called and uh, we couldn't train the models because uh, there's just no data. And then the data started to grow. We started to get better processor storage, etc. Now we have lots of data and with generative AI, we have even too much of the data because mm -hmm. on generated data now we can train the models as well so basically what we see from technology side that uh, people use bigger models to generate the training sets for smaller models and be more specific like industry specific can you uh, take everything you can from like gpt type of models and generate the training set for your private uh, classical machine learning model so basically you can do all of that uh, and that's why i say yes um, the main question how to leverage your data and how to leverage generated data as well uh, for your uh, daily needs. So now it's possible as well, so we can enrich the data. But uh, yeah, the main challenge, I, I still think it's the same, how to leverage your data, how to get these insights and wh why do AI or do data analytics or do both, where to start? So it's still uh, the challenge usually. Yeah. What do you think, Carolina? Well, I'm I am still struggling when I when I speak to to prospects and I speak to customers um, um, when we go into discussion about data um, to 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 leverage how important it is actually to have the correct data in their systems because they are very much when when they are starting projects they are very much confused. Uh, do we have everything? Do we have the correct data that we need for a project to be a successful one? And I think that's that's what's making them, how should I say, very cautious at the beginning to start a project, because they are um, they do know they have been collecting data for months, for years, 
but what's what's the quality of data that's why i am very thankful that we have two point of views a business and technical one to to see the difference in approach and at the end uh, we need both to have a good results right we all speaking about digital transformation in the insurance industry in the finance industry but what is that that transformation about right so this is what yeah. I, I believe many of of companies, traditional conservative companies, are afraid of. Yeah, and and I think that's that's the right time to jump to the use cases because you absolutely yes. as soon as you see how your competitors and neighbors use the data, you can plan for yourself. And it's not about stealing something; it's about how it can influence your business and how can you see the impact which is already there and how can you apply it to your business so i would say it's about creativity and about reusing from different industries uh, we we work across different domains and it's very usual that from retail something goes to insurance and vice versa and from finance so that's why yes i i would say that victor it would be great if you can provide some insights on these use cases and uh, we can maybe uh, think about about implementing those or changing models. It's a great point. I think it's a good time to take a look at uh, several real life success stories, examples, which we kind of gathered to show that despite the technology being in, uh, let's say, pretty early adoption stage, there are already real results with boost of productivity and pretty impressive numbers in, with several uh, insurance use cases. So let's take a look at those. So the first one is from Auto Insurance MJ, uh, which uh, used generative AI to build uh, Gen AI powered uh, virtual uh, customer support assistant, so chatbot. And with the use of this uh, Gen AI chatbot, uh, they were able to get more than three times increase of the number of uh, customer requests, which were resolved uh, right in place by chatbot itself without any needs to interfere with any human support. And uh, at the same time, it decreased the workload of traditional email support more by more than 50%. So no need to say that with the increase of volume of requests resolved right in place, uh, it uh, they were getting rid of waiting time for the customers. So they're getting the resolution, the answer right away, uh, which might be pretty uh, significant for customer satisfaction, the feeling of interacting with the company. The next one is uh, related to underwriting process. So that is a specialty insurance company, which use generative AI to automate uh, underwriting process, so processing of uh, <coughs> submissions received from the brokers. And in this case, uh, AI is doing first technical part on uh, enriching the data, getting additional data from different sources, triaging submissions, uh, uh, filling in the data in different systems. Uh, lots of technical work, which took a very big part of uh, underwrites time and now within this process so the way it's been rebuilt so expert underwriters are starting to work with already pre-prepared data and as a result it gave more than 100 percent increase of productivity of underwriting workflows and at the same time it allowed to increase a quote turnaround for key strategic clients from 24 hours to just two which is a dramatic change in my opinion. And the next one is regarding automated claim settlement. So in this case, it's from digital insurance company offering different lines of business. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the system powered by generative AI uh, provided a record setting time of a claim being fully resolved and paid out in uh, less than three seconds. Oh, wow. So That's really fast, huh? Really impressive. And uh, yes, we can discuss that that is the case for some special condition, but at the same time, that's a kind of benchmark which could be used as a northern star, right? Uh, working on putting more and more percentage of the claims which could be processed within the same performance. So I'd say, as I said previously, 
even within this, uh -huh. and I kind of insist, I, I think that we're in early adoption stage of this, but at the same time, we already have real cases with numbers, with results, and we kind of proved productivity boost. What do you think on that, colleagues? I'm very much interested in that claim uh, settlement topic because this is something what's, you know, it's giving a lot of headache to, to, to many insurance companies. Victor, do you think is it possible at all that, that generative AI can help completely to, to, to automatize this, this process? What do you think? It's, is, it, is it possible at all? Because this is so, from my point of view, super complicated, super complex, super, um, how should I say, connected to so many different um, data sources. From my point of view, talking about completely automating like 100% fully, mm -hmm. maybe eventually somewhere in the future within the nearest mid-range, I'd say that automation, uh, in my opinion, uh, the course of automation of such process goes in direction of uh, triaging the cases and then mm -hmm. separating them into standard ones, let's say simple ones, which could be streamlined in straight through manner, and the ones which should be referred to human intervention reviewing and processing them in custom way. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the question is, uh, let's say some kind of goal is uh, getting more big percentage pr processed in streamlined fashion. That's how I see it. Absolutely. Dimitri, what, what, what do you think from technical point of view? Because like your view is probably completely different than, than ours. Uh, no, no. Well, uh, usually these complex processes do not rely on technology only. So they rely on mm -hmm. people and people. Uh, sometimes people are restrictful to these changes uh, in insurance, for instance, right? So maybe another insurance company is looking at that and they say, well, it's it's something very small. It's, it should not work that way, etc. So I would say that it's great to see all of these companies moving to production and uh, showing the real benefits of the Next level of the chatbots, uh, we already had the chatbots. Now they are much smarter. They can do the actions like as uh -huh. an uh, autonomous agents on uh, in terms of uh, help desk person or support person. Uh, so I would say it's a great leap forward and we will see more uh, things where you get more solutions, more products where in chatbot manner, in chat manner, you can resolve uh, a lot of your uh, like problems and issues and requests okay. uh, and, and the underwriting as well. So if we can uh, in 20 times decrease the processing speed uh, so increase the processing speed of uh, some people so we can boost the productivity. I think it's also very great. It may be a small solution which gets the um, get some data out of the document, but then on a scale, it's huge uh, leap forward. And we were building as well some small and tiny solutions which uh, help to move 30, 40 times faster. So it's low investment, but huge impact on the whole uh, process if you have this process in mm -hmm. place. So mm -hmm. I would say it's really great to see these things moving mm -hmm. to production and showing the real business metrics which are improved. It's very impressive. I'm really curious what Victor has for us <laughs> on top of that, which is already very excited. I'd like to now spend a couple of minutes talking. So here we've taken a look at just three point three separate use cases, but I'd like to bring some excellent that those are not, not the only possible applications for generative AI. Actually, there are lots of uh, different ideas, potential applications, what it could be used for. And here is some kind of list of some items uh, uh, allocated to different parts of the whole value chain. Let's say showing that there are lots of potential use cases uh, at different mm -hmm. steps. And this list is in, it doesn't try to be like complete or full or whatever, but here are some, and there might be much more to that, but let's uh, talk about you know, a few examples. So uh, generative AI uh, looks promising and uh, shows some potential that it could uh, help at very different stages, for example, 
starting from customer engagement in producing some personalized uh, materials, interaction with the clients, or even using uh, virtual assistant chatbots, helping new potential clients to compare different products, pick and select, ask questions, get an answers, and uh, be assisted in selecting what product would be right for them. Moving, say, to the next uh, steps, uh, it potentially could be really helpful in client-facing operations. Uh, the same customer support, it could be external chatbots, which clients interact themselves. It could be internal assistance, bringing uh, agents and internal employees all the needed information personalized for specific interaction and bringing the power of all that knowledge base and uh, huge loads of information which company already possesses. It could be used to automate some pieces of back office operations, such as we briefly touch underwriting, uh, claims settlement, and other applications as well, detecting fraud patterns. That's part of claim settlement, yes, but there might be many more with those. And even such uh, processes and business functions as product enhancement, further development improvement insurance ones. So there could be some examples could be using generative AI to uh, do some risk simulations, to generate uh, different risk scenarios, premium calculations, whatever, modeling. It could be used uh, as an aid to in assisting in, for example, generating filing documentation, which might be a really extensive process uh, requiring significant workload. And here, some technical part could be taken by generative AI. And I'd say that the next step is further exploration, say, how to design, how, how to do next steps towards those directions. What does it look to you? Yeah, uh, I think it's important to understand how to do it. So maybe you can walk you through how it can be done uh, and how we do it in data on the next slide. Uh, usually, we all of these use cases can be split into the phases. And of course, you start with defining your AI, Gen AI use case, and uh, you start from understanding your business, you build hypotheses, then you can select one, two, three uh, pri priority use cases. So first part is ideation, but as soon as and it may take a lot of time, depending on your team, it's really hard to estimate your priorities. But when, when everything is set up, we have uh, this uh, flow, which you can see here. Uh, we built on top of clouds, we built on top of open source, and uh, we start from prototyping. We It's very important to prototype, to see the first results, to research the data, to see its quality, try different approaches, libraries, algorithms, and evaluate the results, and in the feedback loop, enhance it uh, till the first clickable prototype. So as soon as you have this first clickable prototype, it may be API, it may be simple UI. So you see the impact, you see how it works and what it gives as an output, how it, where it's working, where it's not working. So you will become pretty much more confident in building the AI, Gen AI solutions overall. So you will see how it works and then you can scale it. Uh, you can move it to the cloud, you can deploy. And this, what we call MVP stage, MVP development, you can proceed to fine tuning the model to enhancing the data, enhancing the approaches, but still you will have the model deployed. You will have the first feedbacks. You may integrate with other systems like add more storage, logging, monitoring. And then when you go live, you will collect the feedback from real users. You will see how it works, not only for you, but for your people, it may be internal people, external clients. You will optimize like based on your all the knowledge and, and the feedback, uh, maybe proceed with A-B testing uh, or model enhancement, but now it will become like your part, part of your product, part of your feature. And the support stage may be different. You can again add minor enhancements if the data is changed. You can assess the effectiveness if it's working too slow. You can consider different models in future, but this is the usual project flow. And, uh, it's very important to start properly. That's why we have this flow to make it till MVP and uh, deployment to production. So that's how we built and decompose all the ideas which Victor mentioned. And in case you want to like repeat 
something which is already there. Uh, this this is our suggested flow, which we find the most uh, success oriented and the most impactful for our clients. So we really see the uh, impacts when we prototype and move to MVP rather than saying that we'll we'll build it uh, as a project. So we build it in phases in the milestones. So. Victor, what do you think about this flow? Does it make sense to you from the business side? Yeah, I'd say it looks great. It's uh, really that way forward on getting further with the knowledge on what exactly lies and underneath all these ideas. So really excited to see that. Yeah. That's great. Uh, and, and actually, it's not all because when you build one use case, probably you want to build a second one. That's how it works. And you will find more and more and more. And uh, so we call this piece AI solution or generative AI solution. So it's one piece of functionality. It may be feature, it may be application, and it's deployed. So now you are open yourself to testing your ideas and the use cases. And of course, when you have the second one, the third one, you have the same flow, and now you want to build even faster than six to eight weeks. You want to build and deploy to production faster. Uh, and then we go to the platform level. So what we see that uh, it's very important to have a yeah, platform component when you're building AI solutions on scale. Uh, you have the data pipelines, the data engineering, you have the scalability, you have all the monitoring, the cloud tools for building all these use cases. So you will have one single platform implemented and integrated all with all the use cases here and now you focus both on something which is in production and making the first and fast iterations on the prototypes on uh, on the first stages of ai solution and of course when you have the fact uh, the platform is the right time to extend even more and go to the factory level because if you did one document processing solution for one department probably you can reuse the same with a different data for, for another department. So that's where we see uh, this uh, use case scalability part comes in. And you will have some use cases which are already working. And if you're a big company, you want to scale uh, to the different, different people, different products, different, again, internal, external services. So you will have like kind of blueprints uh, which you can reuse. And that's what we call a factory. So if you have a working piece of functionality, which you can reuse with the different data or different cases again. So it accelerates this R&D work a lot, still keeping this AI platform component for uh, the production usage. So this is the, the journey you may take in, in this from technology side uh, in the AI world. And it can be implemented differently on different platforms, but uh, that, that's how we see uh, the, the clients may evolve from the technology side. So I think it's pretty uh, pretty good view. Uh, you may have different one again, uh, but uh, still that's, that's, that's what we see. Mm. Oh, it's yeah. super interesting. I am. I am. Before, I think uh, I know you. You maybe cannot say it right now, um, and we are going to move to a Q and A session um, in a few minutes. But um, guys, if 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 you just look at the the whole year two thousand twenty three, and you think about two thousand twenty four, what do you think we should definitely? Um, uh, think about uh, what should we plan or um, what in what insurers should think of um, in respect of the coming year that's a good one let me start <laughs> <laughs> so you have so many ideas probably <laughs> uh, ideas well let's say talk, talking about some predictions some of things i kind of heard around so there is expectation that within the next year, there will be more and more employees in the company's bigger percentage using generative AI in their daily work. So that might be something we might need to face and get prepared to. So it's kind of moving to further stages of adoption, whether we like it or not, prediction is that is going to happen this way. Uh, another prediction, and it's hard to say about the exact time frame, but there are some expectations uh, that with the development of generative AI, 
it should get uh, more powerful in terms of creativity in problem solving. So going to the next stage, and I think that might unlock new qualities and even more use cases within that part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Dmitry, what it looks like from the more technology point of view? Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, the way to go right now is the way to different modalities as as it's called. Uh, so it's not only about the text, but about the images, the video. So if you take a look at the new model released by Google, Gemini, it works with the different inputs. It may be voice, it may be video, it may be uh, image. So I think that uh, the next year will uh, will help us to build easier these type of solutions, like image to text, text to image, uh, even more. And uh, that's that's what I think is very important, uh, both skill and uh, the the view for companies to evaluate, uh, because it will enhance the document processing part, it will enhance the uh, chatbot part, because you will have better models. So I think that uh, the next year will open us more kind of broader range of the same solutions we saw right now. So it's chatbots, but it will be even more broader chatbots uh, functionality. So I think that it will evolve in like kind of assistant space uh, where you will have more things which one uh, AI tool can do with integrations and with these multi-modalities. So that's what you can start thinking right now. If you have, for instance, text and images, and uh, you now can work only with text, you can already plan what can you do with the images from the um, ideation side. So I think that would be uh, the things which we'll see more and more. So more data and more uh, more data inside the model and uh, more data to use the model, basically. So I think it's the right time for Q&A, uh, probably. So uh, I also want to promote our uh, workshop, uh, which we do as a AI lab. Uh, so you can scan the QR code. And if you're interested in taking a discussion uh, about how e generative AI can work in your company, what tools can you use, and how to start and how to move to production, basically, that's that's what we do. So feel free to uh, send the request and like we can chat about that. Uh, and otherwise, I'll, Kara, I think there are some questions in there. Oh, yes, there is a lovely question. Yes. When I'm looking at the question, I, I think I could write a master thesis about that. But this one is going definitely to, to Victor. Um, how do you foresee the evolution of AI powered virtual assistants or chatbots in the insurance industry to deliver personalized and empathetic customer service experiences? Not better. What Let's strategies can insurance employ to ensure the ethical use of AI in customer interaction? Very complex one. Lovely question. Thank you. And several questions within <laughs> several. Oh, huh? Yeah. <laughs> So let, us, let, us start. Let, let me try to start with this one. Yeah. Yeah. So within chatbots, I'd say that first some aspect, Dmitry probably shared some piece of that. And uh, in addition to that, I think that with the chatbots, potential growth will be, might be in ability to process emotional part of communication with, let's say, the customer, which should uh, be able to scan uh, condition, the emotional state, being uh, able to quickly pull a uh, human, uh, let's say, from the same side, if needed to switch there, or providing better tailored, uh, better shaped response uh, within that aspect. Let's say that's regarding direction of improvement of chatbots. Mm -hmm. I could think of. Regarding ethical aspects, uh, I believe that's a huge question in itself, but some thoughts regarding that, uh, and uh, not just problem, but even strategies. So I believe stress strategies probably will, should be in building uh, responsible policies and following policies and elaborating on them during and actually, as I said multiple times today, we're in stage of early adoption and at the sports, and it means that uh, the, pre uh, the approach and the patterns are still emerging, and uh, some regulations, recommendations also kind of emerging. And uh, I believe what already exists, 
within different West countries, it's more like recommendations. So there are very few, if there are any kind of restricting things, regulations, apart from privacy data. So G GDPR and uh, things like that, yeah, they're in place. So for the other aspects, and there are various potential challenges, ethical challenges with generative AI, like it tends to reproduce bias from uh, training data. Where, again, we're speaking about quality of data and it might be territory when I kind of fantasizing and I definitely will ask Dmitry <laughs> to add additional color who is more practical expertise on that. <clears throat> but I believe uh, uh, there should be some policies of uh, and at the stage of pilot and proof of concept. So monitoring output of uh, generative AI, seeing fine tuning, tweaking and making sure that uh, what it produces, the outputs and the results are in line with uh, policies established by the company if you will thank you victor amazing let this is like such a great question yeah I, I can also i can also do a small comment on this one so about the empathetic uh, customer experience i think that it's maybe you know even more empathetic than the average person because if it's a long conversation robots will be still a robot and you probably cannot trick it as if it was the correct settings as much as the human. So I think that still, if it has like the only goal uh, to serve clients better, it will do the job. And that's how it's designed. And uh, for the person, it may not be the case. They can, you know, go, go for a coffee or forget something. So I would say that on average, uh, the, the customer service service experience should improve and about the ethical usage a lot of um, ai a lot of gen ai models developers are building some guardrails and tools uh, how you can be safe it's called responsible ai so we are also implementing a lot of techniques on the prompt uh, engineering side which can uh, you know let you be in the same loop and uh, speak only about sim single topic not to offend anyone, but for the companies who are developing these uh, AI models, the question is a bit more uh, complex. So I would say that here developers mostly rely on the creators of these models, uh, since uh, you do not train these models by yourself most of the time. You like uh -huh. kind of fine tune them. Uh, of course, you can fine tune them by malicious uh, like software, etc. Uh, but but still, uh, that's that's how it works right now. Mm. Thank you, Dimitri. Just I have a, a right there question for you as well. What skills and competencies are essential for insurance professionals to effect, effectively work with generative AI? Yeah, I, I think uh, that it's a question of personal productivity. Uh, mm -hmm. If uh, uh, yeah, overall sure. yeah, the humanity should understand how to what is the prompt and how to write the prompt so it's all about your expression of your thoughts in the correct way mm. so machine can understand that uh, and there are some rules uh, which like you need to understand uh, but overall uh, if you if you will manage to do that that will be like a basically dialogue a type of the dialogue with the machine where you can be very confident in what you ask and what it replies so i would say the prompt prompt engineering is skill number one and the second skill is to uh, many of the um, productivity tools already integrated kind of generative ai service or feature uh, try to understand how it works and how it helps and experiment with that and as soon as you see that for instance i don't know github copilot is working really well with the dotnet code that's then it's the way to go and the same for you in uh, for instance notion right if you can generate mm -hmm. the uh i don't know tickets in notion or jira that is great so this this would be your skill so do not be afraid of trying these new tools even if they are not working so still continue mm. and try to find your use cases so i would Absolutely, say that's the yeah. main skills I think we still have time for one more question. This one is as well super interesting. So thank you to the audience uh, asking us such uh, amazing questions because this is what this is webinar is about, about the organic discussion. So guys, you decide who answers because I think it, it, it's to both of you, to be very honest, what strategies and practices should insurance companies adopt 
to ensure compliance with regulation and standards such as GDPR, ooh, HIPAA and ISO as they <laughs> integrate generative AI into their operations. Big names, everyone is scared of. So what do you think? It's a big question as usually. And <laughs> I'll also to try to start with a couple of thoughts. Uh, I believe uh, that approach is privacy by design approach with all the practices we are kind of used to data loss prevention, uh, assessment of uh, data protection, impact and that stuff at the stages of uh, identification, concept, design. So having all those principles and approaches on boards from the very start applied in this context. Dmitry, please share your view on this. Yeah, so I would say that uh, you need to be aware of the new developments as well, like AI Act from European government and something will appear from the US side probably as well. So you you need to understand like how it moves overall on the government side and for HIPAA, uh, some clients, uh, some cloud providers are HIPAA compliant in Gen AI as well, so you can check uh, the documentation and the privacy policies of the tools you are using. And for G GDPR, it's basically, I think, the same. Uh, so you need to understand how you store and how you process the data. And it falls under generative AI as well as a processing. So I'm not sure here will be some, you know, different rules. Uh, uh -huh. And I, I saw as well. Uh, so please check uh, how it may impact because it may not impact uh, at all. Uh, I would say that um, my recommendation would be take a look at the security policies uh, as well, not only for the governments, governments of data, uh -huh. uh, but also how to secure uh, your solutions. Uh, and this is something which is important with Gen AI as well. Uh, so this is my take absolutely absolutely thank you guys this is like so interesting i could speak to you for the next two hours but as you can imagine we all have uh, still a lot to do before christmas so i would like to remind to everyone listening to us watching us uh, to not to forget to scan the code and book a generative ai workshop you will not regret it. It's a great fun. You will learn a lot. And this is definitely going to help your company in digital transformation and innovation next year. Um, thank you, Victor. Thank you, Dimitri, for your time and all the amazing use cases. And I hope we see each other next webinar next year. We see how the future of uh, Gen AI is going in the insurance industries. So. Thank you, Caro, for great moderation. Uh, wish a great day for everyone.